now. Uh, and we'll be live in 20 seconds. <laughs> People will be able to see us in 20 seconds. Okay. Or they'll see this. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Uh, if you want to start your welcome, okay. Gio, that'd be great. Welcome, everybody, to session 13 of the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. And we are reading uh, the selection of This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, fourth edition. And uh, we meet from uh, May 19th to July 21st, Tuesday, 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, tonight is the fourth of nine meetings. And we'll be uh, discussing pages 73 through 97, ending the uh, second half of uh, section three. And when you leave, take your pictures with you, racism in the women's movement. So welcome again. And at this time, I'd like to go around and there's only three of us here tonight so far, hopefully more will join. And everyone, introduce yourselves and tell me where you're from. Uh, okay. Hi. I, oh, here's Nicole. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Michelle. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Odom. I am calling in tonight from Brooklyn, New York. And here's my book. Right. Can you see me, Leone? I can't see me. Yep, yeah. I can we see can, you. I can see you. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Welcome, Michelle. Nicole. <laughs> All right. Nicole. Okay. <laughs> and Leone, would you introduce sure. yourself? Sure. I'm Leone. Uh, this is my entrance fee, a copy of my book. And I'm joining you from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. All right. Thank you. And Nicole. Hi, all. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Wilson. Okay. Uh, okay. You, you, you got a little muted at the end of that. Okay. No, you still kind of sound like you're speaking through a sock. Can you check? Oh. Yeah. Check, just yeah. check Zoom to make sure that you pick those headphones. Because we need to hear your voice tonight, because you know we got some Audrey Lord on the plate, okay? <laughs> yes. I think the headphone, yeah, we can barely hear you. So, no, the, vo the volume's very low. It's almost like your voice is being picked up by something far away. Can I, can I give you, can I just try something with you? Are you on a computer? Or a phone. Yeah, I'm on a computer. Can you go to the bottom lower left where the micro microphone is and click the button next to it and see what it says under select a microphone? Oh, yeah, so if you click a select a microphone, yeah. So name yeah. is system or okay. microphone away. I think which one has the check mark? Microphone away. Microphone away. Microphone away. Con connection. ISSP audio. It says. Okay. Is there are there any any other options it says there? Same as system as well. Okay. Well, we can hear you. Oh, pretty okay now. Wherever you do have to keep. Where whatever it is, it's it, your microphone is probably at the front of your computer. So just just keep it there, and we'll be able to hear you better. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, that's pretty mm -hmm. good. Okay, for now. Right. So I think we're in a good. I think we're in good shape. Yeah. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Okay, Gio, back to you. No problem. Okay. Hey, Nicole. Uh, yes, that's right. Okay, <laughs> Leonie, our technical expert, troubleshoot. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and of course, my name is Georgette Moses, and I am facilitating for everyone tonight from Columbia, South Carolina. Ooh <laughs> Ooh. All right. And so we know that uh, next week's facilitator is going to be Kim Brandon. And uh, 
Uh, hopefully she will come tonight. I hope she can. Uh, because we're also supposed to be checking in uh, on our information of, about Darnella Frazier. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I know, um, Michelle, you posted uh, something on our, our oh, webpage. Oh, here comes about Kim now. Okay, yes. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So. Hey, Kim. Everybody, Kim, hey, please Hi. introduce yourself and tell us where you are. I'm Kim, and I'm in New York, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Okay, excellent. We're happy to see you. Yes, we are. Okay, I'm just going to digress for a minute. What is that beautiful painting behind you? Uh, that is my, my black lady here. That's my sister Ooh. girl. Ooh, I yeah. like that. I like that. Oh, did, you, did you do that? No, I did not. No, I did not. I rescued her from a secondhand store. She was in a secondhand store. She couldn't stay in what? there. I know that's right. No, I don't know who gave her away, but not the thing to do. <laughs> oh, man, that's very cool. Thank, thanks for showing that. Oh, you're welcome. Beautiful. So we were just um, uh, mentioning uh, that next week is your turn to facilitate and that yes. uh, we're uh, doing our weekly check-in on Darnella Frazier. So did you have any information to add to it? Uh, I know Michelle had made a post on our webpage. So. No, not really. I just like that this week people are calling her the Rosa Parks of our time. So I just thought that I could agree with that, that, um, you know, for her to shoot that film for 10 minutes without turning the camera on and off, I, I, I just see that it started a movement. And so even though there were other people who um, sat on buses before Rosa Parks, I, I understand what they're saying in terms of referring the two together, especially for such a 17 year old. So, um, and I've not seen any, any more um, updates in terms of her being harassed. I'm just not sure if they're being reported or if they don't exist, but it's nice to stop and honor her. Indeed. Yeah, also there's a, a GoFundMe page uh, that someone set up um, to try to, you know, um, start to, to get some monies to her. The, one of the differences, though, I would say in the, the Rosa Parks comparison, and I do see the comparison, but, you know, Kim, Kim and Gio, um, we read at the dark end of the street together and learned a lot about Rosa, his, Rosa Parks' long history uh, of fighting for civil rights. And so it feels a little bit different to me in that sense that that was that. a kind of, you know, she knew the stakes. She, she, you know, um, she was, she, she, something was going down. She knew that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. All right. Darnella, you know, just, just, you know, it seems, I mean, we don't know Darnella. We don't know, you know, what her background is, how she grew up. She may have, you know, um, uh, a high degree of consciousness um, for her age. But it just feels different to me for that reason. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. yeah, I like to think of it. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Barely. A little bit. I sure wish we could hear you better, though, Nicole. Oh <laughs> is it a volume issue better? maybe is this better we we can hear you we can hear you and i'm gonna i'm gonna fix it a little bit when i do video editing so um, no i was just gonna say that i like to think of it in terms of black girls as like critical literacies like the ways in which that she knew she had to like quickly, critically read that situation and mobilize technology uh, that would ensure um, awareness 
of what happened to George uh, Floyd. And so I just think like she just critically read and reacted and knew to record. Um, again, as I kind of mentioned last week, it's um, it's black women and black girls, you know, bearing witness. And the way that she had to bear witness was to also utilize the, the technology and to create this text this text that would be so critical and instrumental to um, this, the quest for justice. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well let, said. Let, let's, mm-hmm. let's stop for another technical moment, um, Leone. Yes. Did, did you hear what was going on there with Nicole where sometimes her voice would go up yeah. and then back down? Any, any thoughts about? The only thing that I can think of is, I mean, I think ideal if you can get those headphones and that microphone to work, that would be ideal. And um, because I think what's happening is that there's interference with the microphone on the computer because microphones on most laptops are in the, are at that very, uh, on, on like the lip of it. Okay, and so they're you very- Can you hear me? Can you hear me? So there is like on yeah. my headphones where I can increase the volume. Can you hear me? Now? Yeah, it's it's a bit better. Maybe I'll just have to hold the mic here. That, okay. That's that's not bad. Okay, yeah. okay, I'll do that because like I specifically purchased these. <laughs> the reading circle. <laughs> yeah. Um. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. So also, um, Kim and Nicole, um, I wanted to say to you, I did, I did do the clip um, of our first conversation about Darnella. Um, I haven't posted it yet, um, but you know, because I wanted to to um, see if you guys were gonna like work on doing something with that. Oh. Yeah. Did you see it, Kim? It's in the uh, private group. The clip that you created. Yeah. Um. Maybe we can we can talk about that after we're we're offline. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to get to Thank the you. questions. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, well, if everybody said what they need to say and do for now, let's move on. And um, I'll just read through this summary and then we can get to our key points. Sounds good to everybody? Yes. Okay. All right, so it is not the duty of the oppressed to educate the oppressor, but As we finish up part three, and when you leave, take your pictures with you, racism in the women's movement. I am looking for the dead and mangled bodies of Anglo feminists. These sisters went in. They left no prisoners, no questions about who and what is at fault for the petrified state of the cause. In But I Know You, American Woman, Judith Moscovich gracefully eviscerates eviscerates a clueless white woman's request for information about Latin culture, not merely because it follows paragraph after paragraph that belittles and insults Latin culture, but because she holds every woman responsible for the transformation of this ignorance, this lack of knowledge about other cultures that is the basis for cultural oppression. Take a walk on the wild side with Kate Russian's The Black Backups. She names names and evokes all the images we continue to hold with a mixture of joy, pain, pride, and longing. The Black women riding on buses, taking care of homes, kids, and dogs not their own, and harmonizing with heavenly pipes behind bright white stars. Where would this country be without the thousand, thousand Black backups? Mm. It, It is increasingly apparent that the problem is white women. So says Doris Davenport in The Pathology of Racism, a conversation with third world women. 
as she hilariously claps back at the white feminists who intellectualize the issues while upholding the myth of the white woman. Third world women see through them as they act out as both white supremacists and as reactionary oppressed group. Rosario Morales wrestles with all the contradictions she embodies as a white skinned Puerto Rican in We're All in the Same Boat, born into a working class family, but married into a middle class life. Class and color and sex do not define people, do not define politics. And yet this society divides us by class and color and sex. Ending this section are an insightful letter and a scathing commentary by Audre Lorde. In her An Open Letter to Mary Daly, Lorde checks the feminist theologian thus. Mary, do you ever really read the work of Black women? Do you ever read my words or did you merely finger through them for quotations which you thought might valuably support an already conceived idea concerning some old and distorted connection between us. Without community, there is no liberation. A theme and rebuke repeated in the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And so instead of former questions, I invite you to share ideas or quotations from the reading to ponder and discuss and here are a few of mine, and I've listed ah, quite a few. <laughs> so pick and choose and jump in wherever you feel the need. Yeah, I was holding on to my buns. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, thank God I picked this section. This is one I can sink my teeth into. Yes. I'm like, tell her, tell her, tell her. <laughs> they took no tea for the fever. I'm like, okay, girl. If she could have yeah. jumped through that letter and snatched it and look, I took the time to actually look up Mary Daly, okay, and try to read that gynecology piece she wrote. And then I'm like, okay, I can't read this mess. And so I look for a video. I know that's terrible, right? <laughs> I look for a video of her uh, discussing it. And I'm like, ooh, I feel right now what the problem is, is that she enjoyed her listening to her own voice. I mean, uh -huh. it was, look at how <coughs> smart and funny I can be. But at the expense of the rest of the people in the movement. Okay, so, yeah, that's that's what I felt though. Well, I, I didn't look for her book, mm -hmm. um, but I did look for her picture. You know, like I was telling you guys, I, I had found pictures for most of the contributors. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like, I got to see what this Mary Daly looks like. <laughs> and uh, I found the picture, which was a part of an article um, uh, talking about how Alexis DeVoe. So, okay. Audrey wrote the letter, I think it was June of 1979. And then apparently there was this conference in, and in the letter she's asking Mary to respond. And then there was a conference in September of 79 where apparently the two women interacted. Two years later, 1981, Audrey has this open letter posted as a part of this bridge. And after that, she included it in her own book, Sister Outsider. So Alexis DeVoe, I think it was in 2003, was doing research in Audre Lorde's papers and came across this letter, this response from Mary Daly that Audre Lorde had in fact received <laughs> in 1979. And so, you know, the scholars started speculating about well, what, why would Audre keep saying she never got a response? And, um, DeVoe shared the letter with Mary Daly and then Mary Daly started getting it out to all of her people. 
And um, so I was just kind of doing my own speculation. And they, they shared the letter that Mary Daly wrote. And it's not really a response to the specific questions and concerns that Lord was raising. Um, it's kind of a, uh, you know, I didn't really know. And uh, maybe we could do lunch. <laughs> so I think that Lloyd probably said, well, you know, it wasn't really a response. And so therefore, I'm going to publish the open. <laughs> so there's yeah. some dish there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because I looked when I was looking up uh, Mary Daly's book, it was on Amazon. And then somebody pulled, posted in the in the in the reviews, Audrey Lloyd's open letter. And then somebody re responded to that with Mary Daly's letter. And so I read Mary Daly's letter. I'm like, because the person was like putting it down like, like, boom, Mary did respond. And then I read Mary's response. And I'm like, this is, you know, some weak. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but I don't really care. Kind of yes. verbiage. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yes. If you really felt the other person's or empathize with the other person's anguish or feeling excluded or offended, the first thing out of your mouth would be, okay, RG, because apparently they met and talked to each other before, right? They did exchange right. books. Right. I hear what you're saying, and I'm so sorry if you feel offended by my wording or, or feel that I omitted something or used the the only uh, a African voice was in <laughs> it was in the prequel to mutilate genital mutilation, and that's right. where I left it. I'm right. sorry, but let's collaborate on something, which she did say, let's collaborate, but it was after saying, you know, I don't really care what you think. <laughs> I don't right. care about your feelings. In, in other right. words, in that nice speak, you know how we can do that nice intellectualized speak. Right, right, right. You couldn't really dignify it as a response. You know, so what what was all you doing? Come back and say, fuck you, bitch. Or what, you know. Right. What? Okay, you're going to have to bleep that out. <laughs> you're making me work too hard, you know? I'm sorry. No more expletives. <laughs> But I do think, you know, of course, there's this way that Moskovich is saying, like, we're, can you all hear me? I have to ask that question first. Okay, now hold your mic. Just look closer. Right there. Okay, we're yeah. here. Is yeah. It better? Okay, yeah. but yeah. there's this way that Moskovich is kind of centering this, what do we do when we stop the niceties, when we stop playing? Um, around with this thing, and 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 if we if we are not doing that work, how do we disrupt these kinds of you know oppressions and enclosures? They're embedded in, in, in you know sometimes it's it's the the um, covert um, those issues and ways of being with each other that are just as oppressive, right? Even in our so-called um, circles of solidarity and those alliances that we're so-called building. And so I think that this is like, I was, as I was reading it, I was like, well, well this is, you know, hello, call out culture, right? We, we've talked about, you know, call out culture, and whether it makes sense or not, but like it's, saying, yeah, we, we can't keep playing around or being nice or, or you know, polite, shall I say, around this thing. We've got to, like, really engage it and deal with it. Um, and so, you know, and to disrupt it, it's not going to be disrupted if we don't deal with it, I think, head on. Very true. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Um... It's kind of a it's kind of a double-edged sword to me, Nicole. Um, so 1981, um, I was 21, um, and so this is the kind of stuff that was going on um, in in my young 
womanhood. Um, I graduated from college at 22. So I'm still in college when this, when this book is, is published. And Ronald Reagan had been elected in 1980. Um, and and it, it was really kind of the start of a very reactionary period uh, in American politics and history. Um, and so the, the gains of the civil rights were, were had, you know, had been achieved. Um, and we were starting to really experience the backlash um, toward all of that. Just as we are now um, living in the backlash uh, of the election of a black president. This is the pattern. So when Kim talked about playing chess, you know, and recognizing the game, um, this is the pattern. And, and it's one of my concerns about the, the current, um, you know, protest, whatever movement this is afoot right now. Um, you know, Congress came out with uh, um, some, le uh, the House came out with some legislation yesterday I was just listening to some historians talk about it and they were saying that there's some language in there that there, there's something like, I don't know, 200, some number of bills related to uh, black people and, and police brutality have come up over the years in Congress. And there's some language around lynching in yesterday's bill that was proposed in 1921. <laughs> wow. um, but they feel like maybe now they can get it through. So I think all kinds of things have been tried, Nicole, in terms of playing nice and playing nasty. Um, but I feel like it's a, it's a double-edged sword in the sense of if you really want people to hear you, if you really want them to understand, then ripping them a new asshole, it just usually doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It feels good. <laughs> It sure feels good. Uh, Audrey, Audrey Lord was just gangster like that. <laughs> so, yeah. So. But there is a place for that, right? And it's sometimes, you know, it takes that. Um, if nothing else, sometimes I just need to see where folks' politics are, these so-called the bystanders. So sometimes there's a standoff, um, you know, let's say Mary Daly and, and Audrey Board. And then you have the ones who are going to be physically uh, supportive and stand by, you know, daily side or, or Lord side. And then, you know, the ones who are going to do the private, uh, you know, gestures um, to say, well, it's all in private, right? And so the older I get, I don't need the private apologies and the private shows of solidarity is if you, you know, if you can't publicly stand with me, you know, then, then, then let's, let's really, let's sever this thing or, or, or I can, there's a way in which I understand, you know, it's levels to this. There are, I have acquaintances, there are folks, you know, who I'm going to consider friends and so on and so forth, but it's, it's worth us understanding through and through, uh, who we're trying to build with, uh, within and among, you know, these kinds of these political alliances um, along this uh, spectrum, if you will. So I think sometimes I think about Lord's move was to okay, let me see also, or at least it revealed to her where 
other folks sing mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. shall I say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I just love the way she did it, you know, and I'm sure when she wrote it, she knew, well, <laughs> the eyes of history will be on this and how mm -hmm. I say it, you know, how I correct my white sister with love would probably need to be emulated later on by other uh, academics who are coming up in her footsteps, you know? So she mm -hmm. just showed how, how you can do it with class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she did. And, uh, and how people have responded to it later on one side or the other. Uh, the fact of the matter is you did, you appropriated you culturally appropriated someone's words and images to suit your own message, your need. And I, as I watched the clip of Mary Daly, you know, reading from her book, and when she got to that part about the African genital mutilation and the gasps in the audience, I'm like, where were you? I'm like, how come y'all don't know? <laughs> you don't know about this, okay? You claim to be so concerned about women's issues all over the world, but that's not, you know, in your radar, and it takes this woman to bring it to you, but it's in her words, and not in the words of the victims, the women from their lips, and I think that's also echoed um, in um, Morales' piece, where, uh, let me tell you about my life. Don't mm -hmm. come at me with your miss and think you know me. And then don't ask me to give you words. Read about it and find it yourself. Metabolize the information for yourself. And then maybe we can have a conversation on and get to the same place. Right. So I think it's a lot about not hearing. I mean, well, you hear, but you don't listen, right? What's the difference between hearing something and then really listening? And I think mm -hmm. that's a lot of what was going on. Not uh, the fear of I'm going to lose something if I really try to understand where you're coming from and how you feel about the experiences that you've had and are still having. So how does it hurt me to learn how to empathize with where you sit, with your view, mm -hmm. from your part of the ballpark? <laughs> right, mm -hmm. Michelle? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, was, I want to add, too, it is, I think, too, it's a master class for all of us and, like, how we consider or what do we, how do we value what ways do we show that we value or we're devaluing other folks' um, the epistemologies, the, the knowledges that other people uh, present with, uh, they bring, right? And even as women, because here's what I understand. I understand that or from Lord's positionality that even though those white women were the ones she had to call out a lot of times, when you go into the institutions that Lord was working in, um, she found herself, you know, either black studies sometimes, you know, traditional it's English, and then a lot of folks in Lord in the tradition of Lord would be in women's and gender studies programs. A lot of times uh, traditional English department and women, women and gender studies, white women really do have, you know, the power. They have the positions of power in those programs. And so no matter how hard we try or, or you know, we're trying to kind of change that, I guess it's a mindset because we're, we're the institutions are not responding as they should because you have to say, well, how is it that 
this graphic can hold these positions of power for so long. <laughs> you know, there's no changing of the guard, if you will. Um, and so these black women and other women of color have had to find ways to work alongside uh, these black women. I'm not trying to say it was not contentious, right? I can, you know, I, 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 yeah, not saying that, it, you know, the laboring was not contentious, but it, it's so, so what happens, and, and I guess what, I, what I'm really trying to, to, to communicate here is that I would like to see the day where if we're not given an equitable seat at the table, we can get up and walk away from the whole damn thing. It's, I'm good. I'm done. Um, you know, and so because that can't keep being, you know, it's so interesting, Michelle. You were saying you're 21 when this book is published, right? And then I'm three years old when this book is published. And so I'm thinking about, but I'm in my coming of age. What I I understand that the institutions have not changed that these are the fights that they are discussing, you know, in this book, folks are still fighting those battles. It's, you know, we're well into the 21st, 21st century. So what do you do? Because I understand that some people will say, well, why, should, why do we have to leave? Why can't, you know, I need to, we need to stand our ground. I, for me, I think that's, you know, what I, what I would, you know, like to advocate that if it's not, if it's not served, if, you know, if, if the seat at the table, if a seat at the table is coming and I've got to wrestle and fight and do all of this, I, you know, I, I, I don't need to be there. You know, everything, as, as Terry McMillan was saying on, on Twitter, not the first person to say, but everything ain't for everybody. I, I'm not for those battles. I, uh, no. Yeah, well, yeah, me either. I mean, but you know that that's that's why I was kind of giving my little history and you know and why I think that 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 message of when and where I enter um, is is so important because it does matter the the historical moment. Um, that that you come into as a young adult. Um, things do change in a back and forth sort of way. Um, and so the reason I'm always talking about the, the long-term plan um, is because it just seems a no-brainer to me that we should be learning lessons at each step along the way and not doing the exact same thing, not making the same mistakes. You know, we may make new mistakes, but let them be new mistakes. Um, did y'all see, did y'all, <laughs> did y'all see that woman? I don't know her name. Oh God. Um, she was at the end of, of last, last week with John Oliver. He closed his show with her. It's a black woman. Um, I shared her video, I think today or yesterday on Twitter. Um, and she goes, she's giving like this whole history, <laughs> this whole history lesson of, uh, uh, Blacks in America, and she's being pretty cool about it. And then she gets down to the end, and she starts cussing Geo. And, <laughs> and I felt her. <laughs> and I felt her. <laughs> yeah, and you know, but that's that's the thing that we have to keep that vision in our head, that memory in our head of what we've already done. And how this time we're going to build on that. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're not going to fall for the same okie doke. Exactly. 
Okay, we have not heard from Kim or Leone. We need to hear your voices, pretty women. Come on. I know you got something. <laughs> I like the um, number two. Divide and conquer must be must become divine and empower. Um, and the thing I like about this group is that we are broadening uh, the scope and looking at, you know, when we talk about women of color, we're looking at all women of color and moving out of just our own front yards. And there was just so much power in that. So, you know, as we were reading this book and um, it's so many voices in um, this bridge called my back. So it's just very, for me, it's just very, very helpful to just keep hearing stories from a Latina perspective, a Native American perspective, um, Asian um, American perspectives, and just keep broadening that and, and looking at where we can empower each other and how we can each help each other to define, refine our, our, our voices because I think sometimes I feel like we're pitted against each other. Like we're all saying there's only one slice of bread and only one of you people, women of color can have it. As opposed to saying, well, how do we make the loaf for ourselves? What you got to contribute. So that's, that's one of the things that I, I'm enjoying about um, the book. And the, also the other thing is when Audre Lorde is talking about why doesn't Mary talk about some of the, the, the goddess and warriors, what happened to those women? Why'd you leave them out? And so that's the thing that each of us also needs to bring to the table, you know, our successes and our warriors and our goddess. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Kim. You back there Welcome. silent and came with boom. Hey, <laughs> I love it. But I do have to watch whatever video Michelle is talking about because to hear this woman, I'm going to have to check that out. Oh, yeah. You you have to. I'm like, wow. Yeah. I don't know how old she is, but I'm encouraged. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's yeah. the spirit yeah. floating out there. <laughs> thank, thank you, Kim. Okay, Leone. What you got? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't have much, I guess. Uh, I, yeah. Like for me, the, the thing that comes to mind is that, because, you know, here we are looking back at, at, at a movement in terms of the feminist movement and this, you know, over a certain time period up to including the early 80s. And here we are at the at the birth of another movement that's happening in the world, and the thing that I, I mean, part of my my a very persistent rejection of white feminism has been that um, it's a it's, it's a femi it's a kind of feminism that was anemic because it 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 was so dominated by the dominant culture point of view, and so what I'm um, and I'm hoping that that does not turn out to be true for this movement that we're in right now. Um, that as it continues, that it gains more and more perspectives. Um, you know, this started off, this particular movement started off with the death of George Floyd, and then it's gone international. And then that, 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 in a, it, 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 it's, um, people are coming into the movement through different doors, like through different understandings, different contexts that they're in. And I think that makes the whole movement um, a much more effective and, and rich. And so I think that's just the thing that's on my mind is that, um, you know, I don't, I can't join the anemic version of feminism. I just, I just, I, I can't do it. 
I, I, I have no interest. And, you know, I'm also part of a community in which there is, it's very much led by the dominant culture in terms of NVC. And like, I just, I, I, it's why I create, I create my own spaces. Cause I just, I can't be bothered. I really cannot be bothered trying to fight to get into somewhere. Like, it's just like, no. Um, so I'm really hoping that with this movement that it continue, that more and more voices come in and more and more perspectives come in. Like one of the things that I saw that I, I thought was really amazing was this like minute and a half rant by a South, by an Indian American, South Asian man, born and raised in America, but like first generation, like his parents. And he's talking about the fact that like, um, and he's talking directly to South Asian conservatives, just to let them know that the reason why they're in the United States of America is an anti-Black reason, that the government of the United States was using them to, was, was recruiting highly educated people from India to come into the United States in the 60s, most of that they can point at them and be like, those are dark skinned people and they're doing well. And so this man, this South Asian, this American born South Asian man is like calling out, just like letting his conservative brethren know within his culture that like, you have to recognize that this is your movement too. And so it's just kind of cool to think that like, this is the way that he gets in. Like this is the lens through which he sees anti-blackness through his own personal history and that of the, of the particular group that he comes from. And to me, I think that's like excellent. You know, I love the fact that like in the UK, the thing that people are focusing on is that because being, being that I live in Canada and Canada is a Commonwealth country, everything, everything in the, United, in, the, in the UK is named after slaveholders, like essentially everything. But so was like everything here. You know, I was on the phone with somebody who lives in just outside of London in a place called Surrey, in a, in a place called Surrey and Guildford. There's a Surrey and Guildford 45 minutes from my house. Like it's all those things, you know, the, the street that I used to live on in Toronto is called Dundas. Dundas was a slave owner from the UK that it comes from. So there's all these things. And so there's these movements now to rename things and to take down statutes and, and which they're doing in the UK, which is like littered with, littered with monuments of people who are slavers, <laughs> like the whole place. And so I love the fact that like in the UK, like they're reckoning with their history, their deep, deep involvement in slavery and like saying, take these statues and put them in a museum or I'm gonna knock the fucking thing down and push it in a river because it belongs in a museum where you can contextualize who this person is. And we asked you nicely, and if you don't do it, they knocked down that statue in Bristol, they, uh, they rolled it over into the river and that's where it sits <laughs> and they're never getting it back. So, and like in Belgium, in Belgium, they took down the King Leopold statue. Like that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so this is the thing is that like, had this just had have if this movement had just stayed um even like had just stayed in in the kind of vein where it was only like 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 only like a, like a u.s movement all of this stuff would not be happening and it and all of it amplifies the the what anti-blackness does and so that's what i'm appreciating about this book and comparing and, and, and seeing the connections between what the movement that's happening now and what has been happening under, uh, you know, whatever, whatever has happened under the label of feminism is that like, the feminism has struggled from the fact that it cannot do the intersectionality thing. And we have such a gift here to be able to pull in the intersectionality piece um, around this movement. It does not, it, and for me, that's where it, it makes it rich. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I have to say after all my silence. Yay, Leone! <laughs> yes. Leone! He came with it. That's what I'm talking about. Yes! He came with it. Absolutely. Thank you for that 
the international perspective. Beautiful. And and Leone on on that 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 once makes me want to say that there's a Native American man um, that I've heard on a number of of radio programs recently, and he's making the case that you know hopefully the Native American voice will not be lost or will be included in the discussion on police brutality because it turns out the people who are killed by police more than blacks are native if you can imagine are native americans yeah it's so interesting because one of the first moments of solidarity that happened um once this movement went international and how it showed up in toronto was that you heard from um you know um indigenous leaders in Canada saying that they support the attention that's going on anti-blackness because they recognize that it would support their own liberation, yeah. right? Like it wasn't like, oh, look, look at us over here. They were like, no, we are joining in because this is about all of us. This is our problem too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I also wanted to say um, to you, I don't, I don't know if you guys um, listen to um, Sharpton speak or any of the uh, George Floyd funeral today. But one of the things uh, Al Sharpton said was that a few years ago, somebody did the, uh, the DNA or roots analysis on him and, and he found that he somehow connected, related to Strom Thurmond. And so he went down to the old plantation <laughs> and, and looked around and, and, you know, and he was, it just was striking him that every time he writes his name, he is connected to that history, you know, of not knowing what his real name is, you know. And that, that was, I think it was uh, Rosario Morales in our, our readings this week that I thought was really powerful when, when she was talking about, no, you know, I'm not gonna learn English. Why should people learn English? How would uh, an Anglo woman go to another country? And what are you gonna forget? You know, all of your memories from America? Are you gonna forget how you express your deepest thoughts? No. You know, and so for us, um, you know, it's just, it's just a really poignant question because so many of us, we don't know our real names, you know, we don't know our real origins, we don't speak our indigenous languages. Um, and so we're stuck with the master's tools. <laughs> so. But the thing that we, this is true, cause I, that used to be a place of deep mourning for me. And the thing that I have come to realize is that it's true. I don't, I mean, I've said this before, I speak English because of colonialism. My first name's from colonialism. My last name's from colonialism the place where my family is from, again, colonialism. And yet there's still some, I'm still the person of African descent. I'm still the person that comes from the place that all human life comes from. It's still true. Even though everyone has done everything that they can to erase my, my connection to that place, it's still, I, it's in my body. I feel it when I'm around uh, the, um, when I'm around other people of African descent, when I'm around other Africans, um, I may feel it if I ever choose to go to that continent, but like there's still something, there's still something there. It's just, I'm very much aware that my history goes beyond the 500 years mm -hmm. of enslavement. Mm -hmm. I, I feel it in my bones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So both, both of those things are very true. Absolutely. 
Well, you guys, both of you just echoed my number 13, which was how I feel when other cultures speak their native languages around me. I have no native language. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? For me, it's just like, I think, whoops, can you all hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, So like this this section is not difficult at all. I mean, it's a very beautiful section. I think it's just, I have to place it, excuse me, situated in its kind of historical, social, political context and uh, looking at the ways in which those contexts match what I'm currently facing. And so, I don't know, I just, it's just like mourning for me. The words um, that I read in this section just brought me back to this kind of continual of mourning, uh, these kinds of lenses of people are speaking to the various subjugations that they contend with. And I think to my politics of location and just where I am situated physically right now, it was just difficult, like, to be in Houston to know that I've done a lot of um, of my, like, poetry readings and some activism in Third Ward. Um, I'm a Northsider, and so Third Ward is, you know, Beyonce has obviously made Third Ward, Texas, popular um, because that's, you know, also where she, the space that she claims here in Houston. But um, the Third Ward is more kind of south, kind of, I guess, kind of south central. Sometimes it's like, due to gentrification, we know it as sometimes it's referenced as kind of midtown. But it's really a tale of two cities, so, or, or two sides of the track, if you will. So on the one hand, where, where George Floyd is, uh, closer to the HBCU, Texas Southern University, which the CUNY homes are right across from Texas Southern University, you have this fucking pervasive poverty. And I uphold and applaud Texas Southern University because they've always had programs um, to support the CUNY homes. It's a housing project. Um, and then when you go closer to University of Houston, I mean, my goodness, is, I mean, it's surreal. And these universities are not far from each other at all. Um, beyond that, you also have um, just in that area closer to Jack Gates, it's gentrified. Like you would have never 10, 15 years ago seen white people running through the streets and it's just, but the property value obviously increases as white influx. There's an influx of white people, white bodies. And just knowing that, that when, when Black folk move into a neighborhood, property value is decreasing. And when white people move into a neighborhood, there's an increase, right? And so it was just really, this section just keeps bringing me back to what Lord talks about is these, you know, these kinds of injustices, injustices, these tyrannies that we are made to swallow daily. And I just, I can't, I've, I was reading and trying to, you know, because there's obviously this backdrop, this what's going on here in Houston, we, you know, George Floyd, that's our native son. Um, And so it's just horrendous that, again, what does it take for us to move to uh, more equitable positions? What does it take for the positions to change, for the for the institutions to respond to the needs of the people? What does it take for us to look at the ways in which everything has damn near been privatized? All these public services 
and the privatization of these public services that do us, you know, no real, I, I argue, good. Um, what happens when the people don't have power? So, and I'm looking and I'm, I'm, I'm listening and I'm looking at the words arranged on page in this book. And these women are saying the exact same same damn thing that under the umbrella of feminism we are still marginalized there's still a lack of accountability no power oppressed it this was just i i've got to be honest you all it, it again like i said it was it's a beautiful section but it was tough to read um given um the conditions of the time it's, it was just a tough read Yes, that, that is the bottom line of it, Nicole. To be able to see how much you don't have still. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, and I should say I'm probably too. I've I'm, I'm rereading. I read um, Asada Shakur's um, um, the autobiography. I read it like when I was in high school, <laughs> and I'm rereading it. So that probably is adding to. It. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's autobiography? Asada. Asada. Oh, Asada. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I'm, I'm tired of you know this liminal space. Can't. Yeah. We're trapped almost, you know, and so, but yeah, I, but I'm going to come back with one of, with a quote for Georgia. I'm, I'm trying to just get centered, so let me pass the mic here. That's cool. That's cool, Nicole. Thank you for your contributions. Yeah, I mean, I think um, both, both to what Leone was saying earlier about um the the globalization of this this movement um and and what you're saying about privatization um nicole um i i was listening to some scholars this afternoon talk about um how how to go about learning from history they were white folks but how to go about learning from history um, as, as we enter this new movement phase. And one, and one of them said something about how really what we're seeing is a demand for public services. And the public sector has been under nonstop attack for at least 40 years, um, <clears throat> which I, I can attest to. Um, and so right now, Leone, what I'd say is, is the conversation is on defunding the police, reforming the police, um, killing black people, um, but I think we can be sure that that conversation is going to expand and evolve over time um, to a lot more issues that, that ultimately may take away from the specific conversation about police interaction with Black people, um, but could be good if it leads to um, a, a revaluing of the public sector and a reimagining of the public sector. Yeah. Um, I certainly hope so. We talked about this last week that um, the imagination is stifled 
in the United States because anti-blackness is so, the lack of services is in, in, uh, is in a way stem part of the whole anti-blackness piece. And so there isn't like a sense of what social services should look like or what, or even what a government's for. Like there's no, as I said last week, there's no reason why an American would know what a government is for. Right. Because literally right. the argument in the country is you shouldn't have government, <laughs> right? right? So it's just like. Right, but I, I, would, I would say a lot of it is anti-blackness, but a lot of it is good old American greed. You know, the whole privatization thing you know, has a lot to do with just greed. Yeah, I don't see them as being very different, but yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing, but like, I, <laughs> I mean, anti-blackness and greed in American history. By any other name, I yes. Think, I think, I think the, the difference for me is that poor whites are going to become the new blacks. The second you, you start turning out the black, that poor whites become the new blacks. And they are realizing that. And I remember when um, Trump was in office and he was cutting back on, um, they have this program here where it's Meals on Wheels, where people um, just come and feed the seniors in their house. And this woman was, was um, there and they had cut off her food and so she was saying well i don't understand why trump would stop feeding me i'm white and so it's just like well wait a minute if you benefit from some of the public services you're not gonna have them either yeah <laughs> yeah it's just so bizarre i mean the one of the things i, I it, it's just ugh. <laughs> You know, one thing that I just shake my head at is that like, there's no, just let's just for a moment think about COVID-19. The oh, United yeah. States of America has a third of the deaths in the world. And this is in, from the United States of America, which claims to have the best healthcare system on the planet, which has never been true. But American still, exceptionalism. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> despite all the stats to the, to, to the exact opposite of that, like, welcome um and it's like there isn't any discussion around how it is that the united states has a third of the deaths in the world for covid19 and how that does not match with any idea of exceptionalism you know this isn't like a long and you met our stat. president <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, the thing is is that like it's not it's, it's not like you're looking back at like stats from like, you know, hovering over a decade or whatever. It's like, you literally have like body counts. And right. it's just like, and, and it's just like within the United States, it's like, it's not like people are not waking up other than people who are already awake to it, to like how absurd the idea of American except, except, uh, um, exceptionalism is. Like I how, I don't yeah, know, but I, but you, you know, Leanna, I, I think the reason we see so many white folks in the streets yeah, is very related. Hey, yeah. I very hope related. so. Mm -hmm. I really you know. hope so. But you know, yeah. but you know what they You know what that's reflection when when white people get a cold, black people get the flu. Yeah. So it is just when you when you're at the bottom economically speaking, and something like a a, a virus comes along. You know, that's why the numbers were so high in our community. So I, 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 just, I just think that in terms of people being woke, I think a lot of people are woke and everybody who woke up, they only got fired. Anybody who yeah, said yeah. anything against our president in terms of how we were handling or dealing with um, the virus, they lost their positions. And so people stopped speaking, speaking up and then everybody held their breath. When we hit um, 100,000 deaths, everybody held their breath to see if the president would acknowledge it or even say their names or mourn or say something. And this is just he's such a on. for him. Because all he talks about is he's never wearing a mask. And he went to, I forget which city, and the governor said there, don't come back without a mask. So mm -hmm. I, I just think that had... Obama's 
still been president, I think you would have seen some things differently. Not that Obama is, is, is the end all be all, I'm not saying that, but he did have an office set up to handle something like this. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Trump was the person who dismantled that. Mm -hmm. So it's so many pieces to this octopus until you, you just have to look and say, this has been a perfect storm. This has just been the yeah. perfect storm yeah. to have Trump and racism and um, police brutality yeah. and all of the other things all happen during this virus. Yeah, that's yeah. very true. And, it's, and also, and it's a perfect you know, storm. Me, it's a, it's a, I'll just say this one thing. Um, all things then make life as a black person, a person of color in this country, almost unbearable. Yeah. And it's that like, yeah. like, like yeah. Nicole was saying, this perpetual mourning. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I wouldn't say that there's been no conversation. It's just that there hasn't been good leadership from the top. And it's, you know, and, and, and honestly, I'm to the point, I don't even think Donald, you know, I mean, I think he's just not capable. Yeah. I think that we have, not me, but people who look to him for leadership, were looking to him for something that he just doesn't have the capacity to provide. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about kind of early into the pandemic, um, when he was, you know, basically saying to the governors, you know, do what you want to do. It's, you know, it's your decision. And I remember one of the first meetings when Andrew Cuomo went down to talk to him. And when he came back, he seemed to have a new attitude, like, all right, you know, we're just going to forge ahead and do what we do in New York. Wish I could help these other folks out, but, <laughs> you know, we got to figure this out from ourselves, mm -hmm. for ourselves, because there's not going to be any federal leadership on yeah. this. Yeah. New York opened up um, yesterday. I'm not real excited about it. I still think it's a little soon for my taste, but- Yes, yeah, the numbers back you but, up, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but nevertheless, you could see New York methodically going through a process Mm. to kind of get us to where we are. In other states, you know, uh, where, where the numbers are rising, mm -hmm. um, you know that those, are, those governors are, are Trump supporters. And so yeah. that just means there's going to be a lot more death in, in those states. Um, yeah. So, so I'm just saying, I, you know, I, I think there are, are pockets of awareness and pop, yeah. pockets of public discourse, but it has absolutely not been coming from the federal level yeah. where it should be. Yeah. You know, because thing, this is a global pandemic. Yeah. The thing that I find really alarming is that, like, if Donald Trump gets elected again, which he uh -huh. could because of, like, sorry. I'm, it's, it's just time to be like honest because look what's happening in Georgia today with the voting and stuff. That's how, that's how he can win easily. But like that, the United States cannot survive as a country if he gets elected again, because we got lucky with COVID-19. COVID-19 was not, if, if, we, if, if, if what happened with COVID-19 happened with SARS, 100,000 would right. nothing, would have been nothing. SARS had several times more a rate of conversion and death than, uh, than COVID-19 did. And like, if you, it's, it's just like, that, cause like literally this uprising that's happening now has to happen because the country will not survive one more thing. Cause there will be another pandemic. Like that's guaranteed to happen and it will be worse than this one. And you can't have a country of 350 million people and no way of responding to it, no coordinated way of responding to it. Yeah. It's just insane to me. It, it, it is absolutely insane. It, I it mean, reminds me of um, Edwin Chantikat. Um, she wrote this very moving, I would even, can you all hear me? 
Yeah. Hey, yeah, sort of. asking that. Nicole, okay. is it possible for you to adjust your camera a little bit so we can see your mouth? Oh. Yeah, that's that's better. better. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, brother, okay. yeah. So, Edwidge Nantikot, um, she wrote this very moving, I would even call it lyrical um, piece. Um, I'm going to say it was published in the New Yorker, but she talked about black bodies, emotion, in danger, and in pain. And um, all I've you know seen are like these, even the protests, if you will. Um, to me, it's almost it's just like a such you know it's just it's just difficult to understand that these kids these people, many of them Generation Z, young millennials, you know, folks of all ages, but overwhelmingly older oh, Generation yeah. Z and young millennials mm -hmm. who are saying, well, you know what? I, I got to choose my death. I got to choose if COVID going to take me out or this racist, anti-Black, failed nation state. What, what am I... You know, the, I've got to choose here, and yeah. so many of them decided that you know I'm just going to go up against the powers that be and, and protest. You know, the death of this black man, which is also related to um, social stratification, um, the failure of our institutions, and so much more. Um, and so, and, and then, but, but there's a way in which, you know, this, when we talk about anti-Blackness, we talk about, and there's this very uh, coloniality here because we, like, Leone, when you were mentioning the iconog iconography and the, the statues, the public memory of, uh, in the global community, um, and why this is allowed, why do we praise um, these uh, murderers, mm -hmm. these, um, you know, what is this praise really about and, and what are the conditions that would uh, make this kind of, I, I want to say like a, a, true, a, a critical, like a truth tell. What are, what are the conditions that would make that possible? Because I'm just thinking through like, yeah, we had, you know, um, all these other uh, statesmen and um, po po uh, political pundits and figures and so forth to weigh in, but they don't want to talk about, you know, what's happened in the motherland, what's happened in a, a lot of these places around the world, and what these nations do are old. Uh, what what we're old, and and I'm I'm speaking specifically to reparations. That's mm -hmm. the next real conversation to have. Yes. Um, and so, and, and I noticed, you know, and I'll just say this quickly, the tone shifts when we think <clears throat> folks who are too scared to think about the uh, abolition um, and, and, you know, the free, freeing us from the carceral state and abolishing the police. But folks who can't think through that, and so, you know, if we use a kind of euphemistic language, um, defunding the police, which is, you know, some would say a, a step uh, to abolition um, or abolishing the police. But um, but when you think through that, and so the tone shift that I noticed on on Twitter, or at least my little space of Twitter, when folks said, well, it's hard to imagine defunding the police, but they've been defunding education for years. I mean, the conditions that we're asking people to learn. And so again, I think I'm, st I'm still at my, I'm still holding strong, you all, my, my position. I want to see a reckoning, the institution. I want there to be a full-fledged reckoning what people are owed. I want, and, and I think this is just that I hold you know, that we've just, the, the conversation has just begun, again, because I want there to be a centered, a real, and not for show, or, or, or because it's, you know, a, a, an election year, but a discussion about reparations. What would mm -hmm. that look 
Like, what are the conditions that would make that critical conversation possible? Okay, mm -hmm. I'm passing the mic. <laughs> no, man, that's great. It's great. It's what you're speaking to, what I'm hearing you speak to, Nicole, is that, like, it can't just be about what will not be and what, what, what needs to change. You also have to step into the vision of what needs to be created, right? Because... The thing is, like I was reading an article about how essentially the incarceral state is not just about anti-Blackness, but it's also a jobs program in the South. Like that's essentially why all the big jails are there because it's unskilled labor and people can get paid a living wage. And so therefore you have a large prison system, um, you know, in, in the Southern states in which there's lower education and lower cost. And so, yeah, if you were to defund police or to move into an abolition, you have to have a response to what that is going to do economically because it's so part of the structure of the country. You have to have a response to what that's going to do economically to the country because it would devastate everybody, right? Like you can't just take a huge industry and not replace it with something else. So I think it speaks to that that's what I'm hearing you speak to is that like, um, you know, you're talking about like reparations, but it's just also about the fact that you can't just defund police and replace and not replace it with something else and not in like new police. Like I'm actually working with a friend of mine on an alternatives to police project. And, um, um, and so what does it mean to replace a violent police force with uh, a community, you know, a, a community response unit that is nonviolent. Yeah. Like, because so, you have to have something there because <laughs> it's needed. It just, right. it just, it's just that it doesn't have to be violent. Like, I, I, I was talking to somebody about this was on like Black Twitter, like maybe three or four years ago. There's like six police officers from like Stockholm, Sweden, or something, and they were on vacation in New York, and they were on a train, and these two black guys. Were, dr were drunk and got into a big fight. Like, we're really hurting each other. And these six police officers subdued these guys. And I remember it was on Black Twitter because the police officers are like, like, you know, like they, they took the guy and put him, placed him on the ground. They didn't throw him on the ground. They asked him if he was okay. And people were like, he asked him if he was okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like the fact that you can, you know, that you don't have to put everybody in a chokehold because they, used a counterfeit $20 bill, which they may or may not have known was counterfeit. It's like, right. these are things that have to be learned. I mean, I saw today the police union in New York and that asshole, like I just was like, did you see it? Did you guys see that? I didn't see it, who, Lynch? Oh. Uh, no, it was like, I think he's the head of the police union for NYPD. Oh. Maybe that is his name. I didn't catch the name. I, I'm not remembering the name, but you know, it's like one of these like, He's like talk, you know, tough talking. It's like from a TV show, like the way that he's talking. <laughs> he's like, this shield still has shine on it. And it's just like, <laughs> you know, and all, and all this bullshit. And the people are just like killing, like killing it, like on the internet, like, because it's just like, there is, but, but, but I, I see where that comes from because there is, the police have been treated like heroes. They're called, they're referred to as heroes all the time. I mean, all the time. So the fact that anybody's saying anything critical about them and that's happening on an internet, it's, and that it's so bad, their behavior that's happening on an international scale, is just like their brains are not processing what's happening to them right now. Right. Yeah, any right. little clap back they get. Anything, yeah, yeah, very fragile. Short circuiting. I just read something a little while ago saying, um, I, I think it was Minneapolis, 46 mm -hmm. police officers had resigned from from the force, um, yeah. I, you know, uh, but I, you know, I just I think um, as as I'm hearing the defund the police um, argument, mm -hmm. it's it's not about shrinking the economy. It's 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 really right. about redirecting uh, some of the resources that are spent on policing to other public services. Mm -hmm. um, 
and reimagining uh -huh. what it is we want police to do and how they do it. Um, yeah. So uh, I think it was Kamala Harris that was saying, or it, maybe not, I've listened to so many people, was saying, for example, um, if you call 911 to report a domestic violence situation, you know, instead of sending a police, maybe we send a domestic violence team. Yeah, you know? that's exactly the thing that I'm working on. Is something like it's that I'm, I'm starting looking at because you do have alternatives to police in other parts of the world because there are parts of the world where George Floyd happens every single day or multiple times a day, like Brazil. For example, Absolutely. there's like, <laughs> yes. right? I mean, you bump into somebody and, and there's a public lynching and th that's like, you know, Rio has like 5,000 deaths a year. So yeah. um, shootings. They had a whole slew of them in Chicago yeah. this, uh, this past weekend. Yeah. So um, because it, it seems like the police are kind of blue, blue fluing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I so. think too to mitigate um, the conditions that um, support uh, what we want to call criminal activity, right? If I'm hungry, I got to eat. I mean, um, you know, and that's real. Like we literally, folks here around the world, people are starving. They're food yeah. insecure. Um, yeah. I don't know how people do it. I don't know. I'm, yeah, I know people I think who you, you you want to look at what what is criminal. I think it's criminal to 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 be starving and not feed your people. Whereas when we were doing the workshop on um, Rikers in American jail, and it turned out that in order to house one prisoner for a year, it's over two hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. And most of that money does not go to people that work for by the hour. It goes to the super rich. So yeah. if you restructure some of these jails so that, so why if, if, if my loved one is in jail and he needs a pen, why is the pen $5? Why is the big pen $5? So if, it, if, you, if you pull a greed out of the system, you will find that you're not gonna lose that many jobs. So all yeah. of this is based on the fact that these people who pull out billions of dollars a year because they have, they say to police unions, let's make sure you keep those quotas, make sure you keep those bodies in those cells. Otherwise we don't make our bonuses. Right. And so this whole system, I think for me, I would love to see an expose about what happens behind this system, where all the connections are, how all of this works economically, because this isn't, I, I can see people giving cops free reign on the street, but this is all orchestrated by cash. Yeah. Exactly it, exactly. And they exist as well to protect the ruling class, the elite. There you go. There you go their resources yeah. um, and so that's once we get beyond the fear of not living in a police state uh, you know then but um, are we there yet mm, I don't think so um, I think we'll continue to have this conversation about defunding this is an election year so you know there are your politicians our politicians are going to be a little bit more responsive around that um, but but can people trust each other like that or or move to a kind of shared vision and investment in their own communities because when you when we speak of abolition you may have a passive investment you know in your community um, it, it it does require us to really have kind of that uh, Sorry, there. Kind of a sweat equity, kind of um, you know, working together um, in our communities. So are we there? But I will say, at least I'm glad that we are. You know, there's a conversation and call to action 
So I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, what's going to um, come of all this, what will materialize. Um, and I, Gio, it just kind of reminds me of your kind of starting with um, Audrey Lord and talking about the master's tools. And that's, I think that was just kind of what kept you know, guiding me. You know, I kept going back to that throughout this um this section that, and I'm tired of using the master's tools, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm tired <laughs> and I, thing, I want yeah. a better way. Another the thing way. is, is that there are people who are doing things in a different way. That the, So, so the, it's not, yes, you could, the, in terms of uh, obviously the United States, um, like most other countries, but like U.S. capitalism is, is, is special. I have yes, to say. yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's but what I'm speaking in that there, context. Yeah, there are right. people though who li- like I got paid last month eleven hundred dollars out of reparations fund. What? I, <laughs> yes. I was doing volunteer work for an organization. I spoke to my sustainability needs, and they had a reparations fund to pay me money. Wow. Less dollars. I know of co not co uh, of uh, an, uh, intentional communities that have spaces and houses dedicated to formerly incarcerated, where they're wrestling with that very thing of people who have been in the system for a long time, now learning to even like live together, even with other people who've been in the system for a long time, and just learning how to do it without somebody telling them what to do, and ha- learning how to adjust with that. I know people who live off of $2,000 a year because they barter their way through community for all the food and the housing that they need. Like, and that's just who I know. And I, I, I'm, I'm barely touching any of that stuff. I mean, I work with people who try to change the world. So this is why I have it. So, but, so it's there, there's knowledge within the country about how to do that. Like why it is that like, oh, if one, if one of us loses our job, how can we pull together enough money to get the rent paid. Like there are people who actively know how to do that. And also we know it, this is, this is what we come from, right? If, if we start to think of this 500 year, like, you know, this 500 year interlude of, of, of the creation of African-Americans through enslavement, it's, it's just, you know, it's a blip. We have thousands more years of history of living in collective community that's available to us. And that knowledge is somewhere, it's, it's, it's in our bones. So I, I think that's where my sense of um, hope comes from, again. And it's not as though the United States is dead if like Trump gets elected. It's just gonna, things will have to get a lot worse before they get better. And that's just, if, if that that's just the thing. Like Leone, and some of what I, I try not to think about is when I see folks marching, taking to the streets here in America, and I see white males, and I, if, if memory serves me correctly, uh, over 65%, right, voted white men, voted mm-hmm. for Trump. So it's like, it, this is what you all helped to put into the white house. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember white women. I think it was about 50 or so. Yeah, they voted, they voted for Trump. White women put Trump Yeah, on overwhelmingly. But weren't they at about 50 something percent and then white Yeah, men, but he's losing a lot of support among yeah, women yeah, and, and older people. But it's like, why yeah. did it take this mangled experiment for them to understand what and to see what we clearly saw? We knew that this man you know, but this electing him, this was, you know, tragic. So I don't understand why it took them to take those actions that now have to be, you know, in many regards overturned. Um, Would that, you know, take me back to the beginning, to the the beginning, Nicole, where, you know, where I was saying, you know, I don't know that, that ripping an asshole is the best way to get people to hear you. I and mean, we can see just going back to 1981, and we know that the problem is much older than that. They don't hear us. And, and that's the point of this section, 
they don't hear us and therefore they don't benefit from the particular vantage point, from the particular knowledge bases, from the particular contributions that we can make to the collective conversation. Mm -hmm. And you know, to what, to what Leone was saying. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's that's what all of the women in this section are kind of saying that yeah. that that is the master's greatest fear that we will connect and we will understand how to support and nurture each other. And yeah. then he knows his days are numbered. But you know, the devil's not going down without a fight. Trump had a private meeting with police officers and you know, God only knows what, what was said there. But um, I hope we make it to election day, <laughs> Leo. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that like for what you were saying too, Nicole, not only, and, and, and Michelle, not only are they not hearing us, but the thing is what they liked, what they were hearing. If you were listening to Trump, if, if you're, you're, you're the average American, white American listening to Trump when he was running for election, you, greatness was ahead of you. Greatness was ahead of you. He said every, he said all the right things to make people just feel like, ah, yeah, it's gonna be a brand new day, right? And these are people, these white people are also living under the thumb of oppression. They just don't know it. So to have somebody tell them the positive message about things being great and things being restored to how it used to be and all that nostalgia shit. When you have been seeing your own income decline over the last decades, right. you have your seen your own, what that, that would have felt good, right? And so if they yeah, have to step on the backs on a few they, people to get there, they didn't <laughs> mind. But I don't think they well. realize as much no. as they do now no. that that Trump is literally delusional. Yeah. You know, I mean, you got 100,000 dead folks. That's their family. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got 110. I don't even know where we are right now. Yeah. 110,000 yeah. dead folks. And he's telling you we've done great yeah <laughs> yeah best country yeah. in the world <laughs> he's yeah. stuck on that line right yeah i see we have an extra guest kim oh yeah. <laughs> we got a little extra guest <laughs> what you want to say buddy you got something to put in <laughs> you got something to say, you got something to say. <laughs> hi buddy you remember me he likes it. Oh. He says I'm mostly black, yeah. but I'm white on my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> He's truly integrated. More power to buddy. <laughs> this He's has been to fun. To. Um, I, I just, I just, I just feel like as long as this country keeps thinking about scarcity, that you can manipulate white so much by saying. We got to keep the status quo. In so many years, we're not going to be the majority anymore. It's, it's, it's this rhetoric. And so Michelle had sent me a clip um, today when they were talking about the guy who founded the term the alt-right. And he was just like so insane. He was just talking about um, he just wants to keep white pure. White, white has to stay pure. And so there, there's a pathology to racism that I'd like to learn more about because I think sometimes when we're talking, we're talking as if there's one group of, of, of white people and there's one group of black people because there are actually mm -hmm. some black people who are Trump supporters. So it's like, it's like all of these shades of um, different types of, of, of people coming from different places and how do you come up with an equitable solution taking in consideration that each one needs a different message? Like Michelle is saying, like there are certain people that you can, you know, do the Audre Lord thing. But then there's some other people that you know, you may better make sure that you come at them from whatever it needs to, yeah. to happen. Because there are people that just are not, I think some of the people are evil. 
Yeah. And, and 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 what happens in our police force is that all of a sudden you're 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 listening to the same dogma every day and you're becoming more and more brainwashed that the second you get into your car, you have been brainwashed to think that everybody with of a certain hue is a criminal, mm -hmm. even children. Mm -hmm. And do you know how long it takes to brainwash someone? <laughs> mm -hmm. Two days. Whoa. Wow. I thought I thought I thought it was going to be years. It's two days. Wow. So <sighs> I want like, us to watch like the time. The, okay. Like the the quote that uh, 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 Geo put here, number twelve, uh, about the psychology experiment. I wish they had had um, you know actually referenced that experiment because i'd like to read it <laughs> but people becoming catatonic when they're told they have no history um but happy and carefree as a child when they're told they have no future that's kind of fascinating <laughs> yeah yes it yeah is. the human mind the brain it's a you know it's a powerful it's 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 a powerful instrument that can play a lot of tricks on us. And there are a lot of people like Donald Trump with a particular expertise in manipulating people's minds. Yeah. And so, you know, you know, I say to you guys all the time, I'd rather have us focus on nonfiction than fiction um, because I wanna keep us grounded as much as possible in facts. Um, we are seeing the devastation that comes um, in an anti-intellectual culture that denies science, denies facts, um, and just plays with people's minds. And so I know, you know, we have to go off into our fantasy world. That's <laughs> you know, a part leave, of leave, how leave we survive. Leave fiction alone. Leave, leave fiction alone. No, 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 I leave know. Fiction you know alone. Because, <laughs> no, because the fiction, it is an important part of our survival, but only if we're aware when we're in the fantasy world and we can come out of it when we need to. We need to come out of it when the scientists say you need to shelter in place. We need to be able to say, <laughs> okay, I feel you, I got you, I'm sheltering in place. We don't need to have a reaction that's like, fake news. I'm just saying, which is what and I we, always we've say. Seen, we, we, are, we are being gaslighted. We are being... Um, our heads, you know, I'm trying not to curse because that's the word that I would use. <laughs> uh, something something is it. happening to our heads. <laughs> yeah. And it's not good. I guess, I guess I'm just saying there that we're not up here reading Fifty Shades of Black. We're, we're yeah, never, no, whenever, whenever there's a fiction book that we're reading, whether right. whether um, is Octavia Butler or um, the, the the book about um, historical fiction? I've had yeah. Lewis. Fiction. I've and, had and Lewis had on my mind. Sometimes fiction can bring things to light that reality doesn't, and it's still powerful. So no, I'm yeah. not going to come up in here and, and read um, romance novels with you, but um, I wouldn't even read my books here. <laughs> because they, they they don't do the same thing that some of the books that we have read here. So, and I like that Michelle that you kind of say that one is too too far. But when we read the uh, the women of the um, what was it the women of the night women? Yeah, the book of night women is the book of night women is a book that um, started me on my journey around decolonization. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It, it, that's so that's, that's historical. That's it. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. I just, I just want us to be aware that we are living in a culture where reality 
is constantly being manipulated and re-manipulated and we are reaching a point as a as a as a country um, where we don't know what's true anymore, and that's not good for your health. Amen. Mm. And on that note, ladies, we're going to have to cut it short because it's seven forty-five. Loved all your input. <laughs> Got some stuff to go research and think about. Videos to watch. <laughs> And I'm going to close this out with this beautiful uh, piece that Michelle put at the end of the notes. Walk in peace, pursue joy, spread love, and see you all next week reading our story together. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone online. Bye. <laughs> okay. Love so you guys. Can we, can we stay okay. for one minute? Hold on. I haven't stopped.